Uh, our next speaker is uh, our own homegrown, Dr. Emmanuel Berlakis, who will uh, speak to us about chronic total occlusion interventions, state of the art. We couldn't have anybody more experienced and more adept at this. Uh, and uh, so uh, I turn it over to Dr. Berlakis. Thank you very much, um, Jerry, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> It is a great pleasure again to be here, and uh, thank you all for um, coming this morning. So this is uh, CTO interventions. This is the so-called last frontier. Well, I have good news for you. In 2014, the last frontier has fallen. So CTO interventions can actually now be done in a very high success and low complication rate across uh, multiple centers in the United States. Now, I apologize for my thick Texan accent. I know it's a little hard to understand, but you know, it's okay. It's okay. The South does this to you, I guess. So these are my disclosures. And uh, since we have a very <clears throat> diverse group, I'm going to start with what is a CTO. So CTO stands for chronic total occlusion, which means 100% occlusion of a coronary artery. This is an example. Um, what you can see here is you have the right coronary artery. This is where it starts. You're supposed to see it continue all the way down here, but you don't because this vessel has been blocked for a long time and long in terms of definition means uh, three months or more. So this is all that it is. Now, why are they different? Why are they important? One of the reasons they're important is because they are very common. In a large Canadian study, about 18% of patients who had coronary disease on angiogram were found to have a CTO. And if you look at uh, some other populations, like our population in Dallas VA, actually 31%, so one in three patients is going to have a CTO. And if you've had bypass already, then 89% will have a CTO. So this is something very common. You're going to see it a lot. So what, uh, what can we do for CTOs, and why do we do it? And I guess you cannot hear the sound, but uh, this is a testimonial from a patient we did, which what he says is that, Doing this changed his life because before he was very limited from angina and being able to do this really helped him do his daily activities. So the reason we open the CTO, the number one reason is uh, for improving angina. But there are many other potential benefits such as improving left ventricular function, making it safer for a second ACS. Very often our electrophysiology colleagues refer to us patients who have arrhythmias and can get better with revascularization. Reduce the need for bypass, although again, that's not necessarily a good thing. There's many patients who actually need to get bypass with CTOs. But there are many patients, for example, those with previous bypass that are best served with percutaneous revascularization. And also reduce nitrate use. You know, our patients sometimes like quality of life. And for one reason or another, Viagra is very important to that. So by doing CTO intervention, many patients can now take Viagra and be happy in life. At the same time, the physician, we feel good because we help patients. We also get much better in our interventional skills. There is no question if you do CTO interventions, then the non-CTO becomes so much easier and faster because you are used to dealing with the worst kind of, uh, of lesions. And that's, in terms of volume, that's the only area of growth right now in interventional cardiology um, in the United States. And this is an example of why it's bad to have a CTO. These are patients who, have, who come in with an ST elevation myocardial infarction, and in red is what happens to their mortality if you have a CTO. So you can see it's almost one in four dies, whereas if you don't have a CTO, it's much, much less. So it's the principle of a double whammy, which means if you cut the blocked artery to start with, if now you block another artery, then you're at much higher risk than if your other artery was open to start with. This is a meta-analysis from Santiago Garcia from uh, the Minneapolis VA. What's the, the message from this is that revascularizing completely, so getting blood to essentially all myocardial areas, can improve your outcomes. So it have you better survival if you do that. And the number one reason for not doing that is having a CTO. So how do we do it? And many of you have been tormented by my fascination with this book, Getting Things Done. But many of the principles in this book actually apply for CTO interventions. And this is how the process uh, came at, the, at our institution which is starting doing it ad hoc, just trying to understand the process. Then we learn retrograde about six, 
seven years ago, and then the sexual reentry came. And then since 2010, we now have all the techniques available to us. And those can be summarized in an algorithm, the diagram shown in the middle here, which is called the hybrid uh, CTO algorithm, which essentially tries to incorporate all the available techniques to cross through the lesion. And this is an example of what a hybrid is. For those of you who didn't know, if you crossbreed a lion and a tiger, then you get something called a liger, which is bigger and better than either of the two. <laughs> now, I'm not sure you want to be close to that, but, but it's, a, it's a sign of power. But this is what is the algorithm. And this is essentially all this is for interventionalists is try to break down something very complex and intuitively difficult to understand into something that people can relate with. So we always start with the dual injection, which means we put two catheters into both legs and take pictures from both coronary others at the same time. That's the only way to very accurately understand when the lesion starts, where it ends, is it a good vessel if it's long, and based on that, then you can decide if you're going to go with wires, if you're going to use a technique called the sexual reentry, which I'll show you in a second, or if you're going to go retrograde. And this is an example for this particular case. Again, we're starting with an occluded right coronary artery that we're trying to open. In this case, we started with wires, and uh, we do some basic thing, which is use big catheters and use heparin, and be crazy careful with radiation. Radiation exposure is becoming one of the main concerns, both for the patients, but also for the operators who you know, get exposed to this over many years. And our fellows know very well that I'm a little paranoid about it. And I'm very happy I'm paranoid about it. But you make sure we reduce the X-ray machine settings. So, for example, you get less frames per second, which means you cut your radiation dose by half. You try to move back. We use some beepers that some of us don't like, but they alert you that you're getting radiated. So there are many ways to cut back your radiation. And then there are several now very good wires you can use that can, are very stiff and are designed specifically to go through these chronic total occlusions. This is an example of such wires. This is called the filter XT. You can see it's like a spear. It's tapered at the tip, designed to go through a microchannel and go through this. So we try to go here, and this is a picture that essentially highlights the importance of having dual injection. So if you look distally, the vessel is down here. The wire is this dark spot here. And even for those not interventionalists, you can tell that the wire is not moving with the vessel, which means the wire is somewhere it shouldn't be. So what you have to do is get it where it should be. <laughs> it's very simple. I told you, this is very simple. So in this, to do that, you try different techniques. And that's the idea of the hybrid, is that if approach A doesn't work, then you go with approach B. So the retrograde is one of the approaches we can use. So what you are seeing here is uh, we're trying to put a wire through the other vessel to go down. And this is the, the goal, is to get a wire through one of those small channels called collaterals to go distal to the occlusion and then cross it from the other way. That's why it's called retrograde. The blood flow comes from here to here, but we're going instead from the other route and crossing the lesion in the opposite direction of that of blood flow. We use a catheter called the Corsair, designed specifically to go through these very tight and small vessels. And we use some novel guide wires, such as this one, that is essentially double wire. It has double cores, means double parts in the central part, and double coils. For those of you in um, the cath lab, you know that traditionally we had a wire with a single core, single coil. This is double in everything. So th this makes it more resistant and uh, less likely to form when you push it very aggressively. And then we use some techniques that I'm not going to go in much detail, but now we have some established techniques that you can get your wire from when it goes outside the vessel lumen to get it back into the true vessel lumen. And this is what happens when you use those techniques. This is from multicenter registry that included um, the hospital in Bellingham with Bill Lombardi, uh, Dimitri Carbaliotis, which is in Atlanta, and our center. And what you can see here is that over time, you have more retrograde going on, and su success has been steadily going up, reaching 90%, towards the latest years of the registry. And uh, this is what happens in our case. We tried to go retrograde, but as you can see the wire here, it didn't quite reach all the way down, so we had to find another approach. And the other approach we have is the so-called undergraded sexual reentry. And this is a video that explains how this works. This is a, an occlusion. So you're trying to cross with the wire, but as you can tell, it's not going. So you have to find something else, so you're bringing 
um, a, a catheter called the crossbow catheter. This catheter has a blunt tip, so when you push it aggressively and you rotate it very fast, it doesn't, pen it doesn't perforate the vessel. Because again, one of the concerns here is you may perforate. Instead, what it does is it stays within the so-called subintimal space, so behind the lumen, but doesn't go outside the vessel, doesn't go out here. And then once we do that, now we are very close to the distal part of the vessel where we want to get back into. So how do we do that? We advance a new device called a Stingray balloon that has two lumens. And what it does is when you inflate it, one of the lumen faces this direction and one faces the other direction. And by doing that, then you can select the, 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 the lumen that fits in the right direction. Here is how it looks like. It's a flat balloon. So we're advancing the guide wire. The guide wire can go in different directions. If it goes in the wrong direction, as you'll see here, which is facing the outside wall of the vessel, we pull it back because we don't want to perforate, obviously. And then we advance it more, and then we find the true lumen, and then the wire gets back into the true lumen, and now we're across the blockage. We can use balloons and stands and open up the lesion. So this is one of the techniques uh, we can use to do it. There is very limited data about this device because it's relatively new. However, we did show in one of the studies that came from our center that the long-term outcomes seem to be similar with those of the other techniques. However, if you use some more aggressive techniques, you may have um, some higher stenosis rates because you may have to put a lot of stand into those vessels. So what we try to do now is to minimize the length of stents we put into these occluded vessels so that we don't get um, uh, higher stenosis rates. In this case, we form what's called a knuckle, which is essentially jamming the wire in very aggressively. That's something that takes some time but can be done safely. And then the advantage of a knuckle, like the crossbows, is it doesn't go out. Again, the number one concern for this is perforating the vessel. And by doing these knuckles or crossbows, then you can avoid that. And then we make sure that we are where we think we are by looking at what's called a dance, meaning the vessel moves with the wire. Then we use the stingray in this particular case to get back in. And here we are. We have now a guide wire that is into the distal through vessel. And uh, what we do next is we place stents. And here's the vessel we were missing in the beginning. So now we have good blood flow going all the way from the beginning all the way to the end of the vessel. So this is how a successful outcome should look. So to summarize, CTOs is something common. You're going to see it on your practice every day. And uh, now we have the tools and techniques to get them recanalized. And by doing that so, we can have significant clinical benefits. If you're going to learn how to do this, we have a manual that came out. Obviously, I'm a little biased about the merits of this manual. But um, um, this is one uh, accumulation of essentially every CTO operator in the US that does the hybrid procedure that distills kind of the tips and tricks of doing that. So I'm going to stop here and thank you again all for your attention.